we just change all the time. Everything is constantly in motion and constantly changing. And yet there's something about existence where existence wants to stay existing as it is from moment to moment. So a, a proton wants to continue being a proton. Jason wants to continue being what he recognizes as Jason in the next moment. So even before we get to personal psychology, the nature of the world is that it won't budge. And we have to notice that because when we meet resistance, we have to not be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. have to not be concerned that it's all ours psychologically. That sure. We are responsible for not being better or whatever, or getting what we want or whatever. But there's going to be a natural moment of resistance because it's the nature of the world. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be speaking with Jason Shulman. Jason Shulman is an American spiritual teacher whose original work springs from his Judaic and Buddhist background. He is the founder of a Society of Souls, the School of Non-Dual Healing and Awakening, based in the United States and the Netherlands. There he teaches the distinctive body of non-dual work he has developed to awaken the human spirit, non-dual healing, impersonal movement, and the work of of the return. Tell me a little bit about uh, your process and how you came to do the work that you do. Hmm. Well, Depends how far back we want to go. I leave that to you. <laughs> but I would say, I would say, how I came to do the work that I come that I've come to do uh, is because uh, I was born as a suffering human being, mm -hmm. and uh, as as are we all. Mm -hmm. And uh, suffering, it, when it hits fertile ground, it's a good thing because. Uh, I wanted to find out why I suffered and what it was all about. And that became a kind of uh, consuming interest of mine from the time I was, I would say, five years old, really. Mm -hmm. I, I really just wanted to know why I was here and what life and death were about and so on. So by the time I was uh, 17, I was a Zen student. And... Uh, then that went on, my spiritual search went on both psychologically and spiritually for many years. And then in my late 20s, 30s, I got very early 30s, I got very ill with a mysterious illness that nobody knew, nobody knew what it was at that point. Mm -hmm. So I was never really treated properly. And through that got into healing. And they found out, by the way, it was Lyme disease. Mm. And um, it was a terrible ordeal for me. And so then I added to my spiritual life the, the concept of healing, of uh, improving, of getting better, of uh, healing illness and so on. And I became a healer. Uh, but with my backgrounds in Buddhism and uh, my birth in Judaism and being interested in Kabbalah, the mystical arm of Judaism, mm -hmm. um, I started uh, creating my own work, which eventually brought the foundation of our school, uh, a society of souls. And uh, people started studying with me. I had no intention, Hale, I have to tell you, I had no intention ever of being a spiritual teacher or being a healer, let alone uh, having an organization and a foundation. And so sure. on. It was not not in the cards for me, but but it was <laughs> in <laughs> someone else's deck. <laughs> uh, yeah, God, put, we plan and God laughs. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I guess he chuckles a lot then because <laughs> a lot of us can't help but uh, <laughs> make plans every day. 
<laughs> so, so all of that went on, and my work became <clears throat> very involved with trying to understand two threads in myself. Uh -huh. One was uh, the deistic path, you know, like Judaism, mm -hmm. Catholicism, or Islam, where God and we are separate, and we have to find out what God wants of us, and and try to do that, and to follow a path of uh, blessing and openness to the divine, sure. and so on. And uh, the other path was my Zen path, which didn't deal with any of those things, right? Seemingly, yes. And uh, and I alternated in my need for each one of them: the personal self, the guy who would get into uh, trouble one way or the other, needed a uh, a force outside of myself, yes, bigger than myself, to be able to guide me and heal me and so on. And then this other part, which was kind of an explorer of consciousness, loved sitting Zen and meditating and uh, just feeling the um, web of connection that uh, arose from that kind of uh, that kind of work. And I knew instinctively as as most of us do that these two things must meet they mm -hmm. must be the same on some level and a lot of my early work was in reconciling those two paths until i understood the the unity of both of them mm -hmm. and um at which point the school was a a going concern we have classes in um copenhagen and dubai and uh, New York City, and of course, most of this stuff is online right now. Sure. And um, I became interested also in how this, I've always had a practical frame of mind. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in how does this work actually change our daily life? How yes. does it change my relationship with my wife, with yes. my child? How does it help me resolve conflict in myself or with other people or other organizations. So um, through that, I began, and through meeting with people who were my mentors and listening to them and having conversations about world situations and so on, we came to a point where I came to a point where I really wanted to develop a way that was commensurate with what I understood about reality and to make it down to earth and practical so that we could actually use it to do those healing things that I felt so strongly about. Sure. Sure. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about the, the process that you, uh, well, whatever you can share. I know you wrote a whole book about it. Okay, I'll, sure. I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. So, so maybe I can maybe I can get into it in this way. I had a uh, a wonderful man who uh, became a mentor to me. His name was uh, Zalman Shakter Shalomi. Mm -hmm. and he was uh, a Hasidic rabbi originally, and then uh, created the whole concept of Jewish renewal. He was a very important figure. Anyway, I was having lunch with him one day with my wife in Colorado. I had flown out to have lunch with him. Uh -huh. That's how important he was to me. And he said, you know, the world situation is so terrible. Maybe we should have a group of rishis who will guide the world in healing. Rishis being the Sanskrit word for enlightened beings who... Uh, you know, know something, know a thing. Right, right. Yes, yeah, that's it. So, so I, I immediately got nervous <clears throat> because uh, who's going to find these rishis? Right, right. And anybody who says, me, I'm a rishi, let me... Probably move. isn't. <laughs> yeah, we, want, we, want to, we want to probably you know, have a cup of tea with them and calm them down. Uh, right, 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 right. But it got me to thinking that... I wonder if there was a process mm -hmm. by which a person could become a Rishi mm -hmm. or could become a temporary Rishi while they use the process mm -hmm. where it could divest them of their illusions 
and bring them to a, a ground level kind of relationship with the world and with the inner conflict and outer conflict and the resolution of that conflict. And uh, I set myself the task of uh, doing that. Great. Trying to do that and figuring out how that could be done. And, you know, a lot of this is uh, mysterious because uh, I gave you a kind of outer view that was, um, it sounds as if this was all rational and planned out. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't because at the point uh, at the point that it all started coming together over a period of time, a couple of weeks to create the process itself, it was much more akin to creating a a, a piece of art. Yes. So uh, I have to be a musician also, but even if I, and I also used to paint. So when you're painting, even if you're going to map out what you're going to do and you are going to paint from a photograph or you have a structure at some point that's not what's going on right, right. that's not what's going on yeah and the art leads you you don't lead the art yeah, it, it eats you up it, <laughs> it ingests you yes and, yes and absolutely you, you find yourself wandering around a kind of force push this way and that which color which brush which palette knife which part which part you erase which part you put on so it was very much like that with this process that's great and, and what came out of it were 38 imagistic sentences uh -huh. that seem to hold a kind of i've likened it to an instruction set for reality mm -hmm. it seems to be about how we as individual human beings and reality interact uh -huh. this is what happens we could say it's archetypical uh, it's also mysterious it's also rather poetic and it takes a little bit of uh, time in the book i describe each one of these steps stages i think we call them and no steps in this book steps of how to use them and as you do these very short meditations with them they lead you to the next one and the next one and the next mm -hmm. one and um really have helped people enormously to resolve inner conflicts and outer conflicts and um people are taking it in, in ways that i never imagined they're using it with kids who don't even understand the yes. uh, the, sentences. the sentences yeah uh something there's something inherent about them that uh seems to come through so i'm happy just to have uh created it and let it go so yes. that people can work with it and and uh, let it unfold yeah that's beautiful yeah yeah no, don't you find that when you do this type of work again i've been uh, very fortunate to have been <clears> involved in in the work that I do since mm -hmm. 1976. Mm -hmm. And what I found through the years is that it evolved itself. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely art as opposed to science, although it was duplicatable. <clears throat> uh, I, I love that you said that, just to interject for a second. Yeah, sure. I've always loved duplicatable things. Yes, yes. That's so important that it's not just mm, a piece of charismatic light that comes that nobody else can duplicate. Right, right. Well, but that's that. nothing, nothing wrong with that either, except that. Right, right, right. But right. again, I, I think we have a similarity in that we both want to um, wanted to create something that would be do it yourself. That's right. That the, it wouldn't create a sense of dependence or uh, the you know, the person has to come to you to get it done, they can discover this within themselves. And, right. and, and it feels to me when that's all that's going on is that, that it's just, there's the body mind is just the vehicle. It's not, it's not I'm doing anything. Doesn't it feel that way to you too? Not exactly. Um, How does it feel? <clears throat> well, in my perspective, it's a co-creation. Oh, okay. The, the, the I 
needs to be uh, healed, so it's a good partner. So the ego, for instance, which most of us, uh, all of us have an unhealed ego, and therefore a problematic ego. As that ego is healing, it becomes a, a, a thing of beauty and a perfect vehicle to be in a marriage, so to speak, with the cosmos. Uh -huh. So the, the, the universe loves the individual, and the individual ends up loving the universe. And you have uh, both of those coming together yes. in this creative synergy. Oh, so, that's beautiful. Yeah. Which, is, which is why, you know, part of our work and part of what this process does is to begin to heal that unhealed ego so that it's a good partner, a reliable partner for uh for reality instead of just being an egocentric idiot <laughs> excuse the expression <laughs> yeah well, well we also we're hard on ourselves this the, to we the are that we we're are. identified as as a person we're hard on ourselves yeah it yeah, comes with yeah. it comes with the territory <laughs> absolutely yeah so oh, can a, you can you share anything from the book that people can take with them uh is there a, i mean maybe a starting sentence or sure sure uh, I, again with these interviews what i always like to do if there is something that that the the person i'm speaking to can share that people can then take with them and use whether or not they ever pursue your work that, that would be wonderful Sure, I'd be happy to do that. That'd be great. And I'd be, I'd be interested. I'd be interested in hearing your reaction to it sure. too, because I think, I think because even in this short meeting that we're having right now, I see a lot of common points of, of uh, perspective that you and I have. Yes. I'm sure, there are differences as well. Of course, of course. So, so it'd be very interesting for me to talk about that. So, for instance, the very first step is a very unusual one. Uh -huh. It's a language is unusual, and I'm going to kind of open it up and tell you why it's there. Okay, sure. Or why it put itself there. Sure. Two, put it the other way. First, so the first thing people do in working with the non-dual process for conflict resolution is you write down a question or a desire. Uh -huh. So maybe the desire is, uh, you know, I... Uh, want to find uh, I, I, I want to live in Seattle and uh, that's my passion and I have to go there uh -huh. then we have a process called bracketing which precedes all of these steps where you kind of intimately look at that sentence and say is that really what I'm asking yes is that is that a good thing like I want my political party to win because I'm sure that we're right uh -huh. yes say, well if they win, what happens with the people who are going to be, are those the best people? You start letting yourself doubt your own question, and the question morphs and changes until you feel settled with what the question is. So there's immediately a process where we don't take our own desire, our own question at face value. We already kind of like, go, all right, well, is this going to work? Is this the right thing for me to want? Yes. Then we start with the steps once we get the question or desire. First, the barrier of earth, excuse me, I'm reading my own work wrong. First, <laughs> the barrier of angry earth plane vectors. Now, a lot of the language is not like that at all, but this first step is kind of scientific in a way. First, the barrier of earth, angry earth plane vectors. What that means when we unroll that is that even before we begin trying to change ourselves or change a situation, we're going to encounter an aspect of reality that we need to take notice of, which is that reality does not want to change. This is very interesting because, on the other hand, all reality is, is change. We just change all the time. Everything is constantly in motion and constantly changing. And yet there's something about existence, 
where existence wants to stay existing as it is from moment to moment. So a, a proton wants to continue being a proton. Jason wants to continue being what he recognizes as Jason yeah. in the next moment. So even before we get to personal psychology, the nature of the world is that it won't budge. And we have to notice that because when we meet resistance, we have to not be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. We have to not be concerned that it's all ours psychologically. That sure. we are responsible for not being better or whatever, or getting what we want or whatever. But there's going to be a natural moment of resistance because it's the nature of the world. Yes. But is it really the nature of the world to resist or, or to to resist change or to not want to change? Or is it or is it the the human reaction to it? Because as you said, the, the world is in constant flux. Even mountains are changing. Yes, it is and it isn't. So everything we can agree immediately that everything is in flux. Everything is a wave. There's this vast wave yeah, through the all, universe. It's all energy, yes. It's all energy. It's all moving. At the same time, the notion of existence, duration, being the same from... For instance, the lifespan of a proton is approximately the same as the lifespan of the universe, about 13 billion years. It doesn't want to change. It doesn't want to easily become an electron or a lepton or whatever other ton it could possibly be. So the nature of solidity itself, even though this pencil that I'm holding here in 10,000 years will have disintegrated because everything falls apart, it holds its shape. It holds its center. It is what it is. It doesn't want to be, it doesn't want to morph into anything else. So this is not a psychological, from the point of view of the non-dual process, this is not a psychological or value statement. It's, no, no, just, I, yeah, sure. it's just a statement. It's like, and if you're going to meet that, you're going to run into some danger, which is the second. When we want to change something, we're going to run. Now we're getting personal. We're going to run into some danger. Now that danger that happens is already reflecting our egoic struggle to not change, to maintain the stability, even if it's killing us. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, yes. So admit to danger. So those two first steps, in a sense, allow us to relax and say, okay, I'm going into a process about change, and I'm going to encounter the will not to change. It's expected, and, I, and it's workable, and I can go further and work with it. I don't have to be mugged by these two aspects of reality, one universal and one personal, <clears throat> to uh, not get to the parts where I can morph and change into something new. Mm -hmm. And then the process moves on from there. So uh, these two first steps are not to deter somebody from uh, moving onward, they're to really set up the conditions for change. My opinion is that the more we have our eyes open to what things actually are, the more um, agency we have mm -hmm. of being able to change. We don't want to start from fantasy. We want to start from reality uh -huh. and continue with reality if we possibly can. <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a good aspiration. <laughs> wow. Don't you don't you try every day to do that? <laughs> well, uh, to some degree, yes. But on another degree, what I've noticed is the less that there is this sense of a personal center, the the less there's a need for that knowingness. The the two go together. Yes. And and then what's left behind is this sense of just an openness to whatever's apparently happening as it 
as it's apparently happening. And then the need to exert agency over it or to fix it or control it naturally seems to drop away. Mm. And there's a harmony and cooperation between whatever is apparently happening mm -hmm. and the body mind. Mm -hmm. um, when that's honestly come by, I agree. I think that's, I think the way I would interpret that from my work is that <clears throat> the ego, <clears throat> when it is uh, unhealed, is troublesome and separate. Uh -huh. When it's healed, it's like, uh, I've said this before, but it, it, it's a good metaphor. If my thumb is has a cut, I, am, I notice my thumb. It's separate in some way. Uh -huh. when, I, when the cut is healed, I just use my hand. I don't think about it. I don't reflect upon my hand. Yes, yes, um, yes. It's the same thing with the ego from a point of view of our work. When it's unhealed, it has a cut and it stands separately and we have an overly developed sense of separate self. Yes. Overly developed sense of needing to protect the territory of our will and our separate self. Yes. As it heals, we still have an ego. Only the ego is a useful, beautiful thing of beauty, which is integrated into our totality. Mm -hmm. If I call uh, your name, uh, you answer. Yeah, you absolutely. Some, you didn't go into some <laughs> trance, uh, but uh, you also are, uh, are open to hearing what I'm having, what I'm saying and thinking about it. And it doesn't threaten your life. <laughs> right, 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 right. The, the same thing. So we're, we're headed toward the same place. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah. I pay, I pay a lot of attention to the pitfalls along the way. Yes. And um, so that people don't come to having less of a sense of self with um, uh, misconstrued ideas about what that means. Yes, because we always, we have as long as there's a sense of a personal center there, there's there's a conceptual framework that's part of that. And it's, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of misconstruing in that. <laughs> so we want to heal, we want to heal those misconceptions. And then yes. my experience is as we do that, this sense of a entirely separate self uh, melts and sub is subdued. But you know, I also should, but in truth and advertising here, uh, I'm a friend of individuality. Uh -huh. I'm a friend of uh, this stone looking different than this stone and yes. having its own soul and meeting you <clears throat> with your experience and all the work you've done since the 70s is you're, you're, you're a different person than I am. You're a different life than I do. And each one of these things... Um, co-arises with the universal for for me yes yes so, you know the co well, they're not they're not in any way in conflict right they're they're things of beauty for me the 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 individual self the relative world the absolute world um codependently arising they arise together foreground and background to each other mm -hmm. so there's nothing to uh, uh protect yourself from whether yes. it's a personal self or a reduced sense of personal self. It's a matter of the basic defensiveness that human beings have mm -hmm. when they're overly identified with separateness. Yeah. Or one way or the other. Another problem is people who are overly identified with the universal. There have been some terrible things that have happened with, from people who have been over-identified with the universal and forgotten about individuals don't think in terms of individuals sure sure so. yeah well the it, it there's as long as there is a, a sense of individuality it, it's there's self and other so there's two and there's there's uh there is tension in that and yeah. and as that dissolves so does the tension or vice versa as the tension dissolves the, the, again we're we're agreeing on some level because 
the, the, again, the, I don't know what you know about the Sedona method and I don't know but, too much, actually. but, no. but it, it was developed originally by a man named Lester Levinson, who was sent home to die from a second coronary and decided to go back to the lab within himself to find a solution. And he lived another 42 years after the doctors gave him that death sentence. And what he discovered is that we all have the ability to let go of whatever it is inside of us that's causing the inner conflicts and the, the constriction and the, the apparent problems and all of it. And it's something that you can use uh, with yourself to just simply dissolve all that excess baggage that we identify with and, and think we need to carry around with it ourselves and in doing that things just seem to it's it's very practical it's very done eyes open in life and when people engage in it their lives transform radically for the better i just ordered a copy of your book <laughs> <laughs> since i wasn't so familiar with it i started i just did a few minutes of reading i said this is pretty interesting i think i'll get a copy <laughs> so okay. you know the, the way i would uh, rephrase that just so that it's in my language oh go right ahead sure. all of those all of those extraneous things that the the sedona process from what i'm getting very quickly of course yes. uh, just on the first thinking those are those are the unhealed ego yeah what remains would, yes. the yeah, that's how I put it. What remains is still a separate self, but it's not a separate self that stands in opposition. It's a separate self that stands as a location where the universe can appreciate itself. Yes, yes. No, no I, I'm completely familiar with that point of view, com completely. And and uh, uh, and a lot of uh, what uh, what's come up here is that that uh is a also a stage and there's a there's uh there's something beyond that where there even the sense of the separate self uh has dissolved and and then there there's still of <clears throat> course you uh the uh, unique objects appearing within that but the sense of a me in relationship to it actually uh, dissolves and then there's just what's apparently happening and that is um it's actually indescribable it's very hard to talk about but but the the point that you're describing that where where there's there's no longer this overwhelming conflict with what's happening there's a a sense of being aware of it but not fully engaged in it uh, and allowing what is to be as it is, is a stage that most people need to go through. And it, and even if you never do more than that, it's miraculous compared to the way most of us live our lives. Yes, I think it's, think it's, if more people were at that level, we'd have less insane conflict. Exactly, exactly. I know what's happening in the world now. <clears throat> exactly. And and you're at you and and you're with what you're doing, you're helping people do that, which is beautiful. Yep, yeah, that's what that's what we're trying to do. I'm very interested in the middle ground, let's call it that. Yes, yes. You're calling it a you're calling it a stage. Uh, I'm I'm less interested <clears throat> in the mm, you know we'd have to talk longer to see if if there was really a difference because the the uh, experience that I have and that I have uh, historically understood of the self disappearing entirely. Um, and I don't know if that's something that happens through the process that you write about, the Sedona process. The Sedona goes, process yeah. doesn't actually, the, the goal of the Sedona process 
the 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 main Sedona process. We we have something that we call the fifth way or the freeway or the no way. That mm. is more focused on that beyond completely beyond the separate self. But most of the work that we do is just designed to help exactly what you're talking about to right. to to end the 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 unnecessary conflict to end the striving and the struggle to to live life wide open and fully engaged and really uh just loving what is as it is and that's, that that's is, where my heart is yes that's, yes that's where my heart is that's that's the center of our work no i know it's because, beautiful it's beautiful yeah that's great yeah uh, so so is oh, there anything I look at that fifth way yeah you have a book on that as well uh no i i do um the the fifth way is uh, well there's talked about a little bit in uh, i have two books one is called the sedona method the other one is called happiness is free which i wrote with which is wester's teachings with my interpretation um and so i talk a little bit about it there but mostly it's something that we do in our live programs because it's much more if it's written down it starts to uh, as a process it starts to lose its impact uh, whereas the Sedona method can be completely written down and people can just take themselves through it. And again, these miraculous things happen. Uh, the other one is more something that just happens spontaneously in, in this that's happening. And it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm sure eventually I'll write a book about it, but it's not i haven't written it yet <laughs> but anyway let's not focus on me let's focus uh is there something is there uh, what is if you were to summarize a, a message for people because i i i want to see if we can bring it back to focusing on your work how would you summarize what you do in a way that people can know how to hold it and maybe work with it on their own, and or of course get your book. Sure, sure. Uh, the the non dual process for conflict resolution is just one part of my work. Uh -huh. uh, the other parts of our work are are in depth training in the type of healing that I developed, a hands on uh, method of healing. We have a uh, a uh, movement work, a non dual movement work called impersonal movement and a self-healing modality called the work of return. And I think if there's a thread that holds all of those things together, there are probably many threads, but one of the threads is kindness. Mm -hmm. uh, we put a tremendous um, emphasis on the lubrication for walking the spiritual path and daring to look at your imperfections and daring to see how they can be healed and helped is kindness toward the self, uh, which is the origin of kindness and instantly makes us kinder toward other people yes, and really yes. makes us into undefended beings. Yes, yes. So we're not a path of idealization. Sure, we, sure. Don't, we don't have a, 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 an ideal uh, outcome. Yes, yes. I guess our ideal outcome is for people to fully be themselves uh -huh. living in an open-hearted undefended way uh -huh. except when they are defended and when they are defended loving that as well yes yes looking loving all of those imperfections and so on so i think that's one of the important threads. it's was an important thread in my life personally you know we always uh, teach what we're learning yes of course and, and uh, uh so that's been uh, a hallmark of of the work that we do is it's a tender heartedness, really. Even as a Zen student, uh, that's what I came to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, you and the Dalai Lama agree. Well, good. I love that. <laughs> Did he say that also? Yes. He, 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 one of the things that he said, one of the many beautiful things he said, but one of the ones often quoted is the, the most important thing. Someone asked him, what's his most, most important teaching? And he said, kindness that's it 
That's it. Otherwise, there's no reason to sit on the cushion. Right. <laughs> or to walk around. <laughs> walk around. That, was, you know, that was my metaphor for the same thing. I know. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, anything else you want to add before we bring it to conclusion? No, I enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to learn more about your work and see what all that is about. Um, if people want to find out more about what we do, there's two ways. Church. One is going to the school site, which is societyofsouls.com as one word, uh -huh. societyofsouls, S-O-U-L-S, uh, dot com. And then the foundation for non-duality is our not-for-profit foundation that was uh, founded to move this particular modality, all the modalities that I created uh, out into the world more. And that's nonduality.us.com. And there people can find uh, videos, uh, short videos of teaching. They can find excerpts from the books. They can find some of my students' work. Um, and um, they can be in contact with like-minded people. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jason Schulman. You can learn more about Jason at www.nonduality.us.com. That's N-O-N-D-U-A-L-I-T-Y dot U-S dot com. If you've enjoyed these podcasts, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor, Lester Levinson's work in the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you'll learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A.com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secret.